Hey everyone, before we get into today's show, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors, Coinbase Prime and Ledger. Love these companies, genuinely proud to call them sponsors of the show. You're going to be hearing all about them later from me, but now on with the program. The former president of the United States was a fucking troll on Twitter. Because if we don't reform what's going on on social media, uh, we can't get anywhere else. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of On the Margin. I am joined again by Mr. Dimitri Kofinas. What's going on, Dimitri? Um, good, man. Everything's real good. I was telling you this before we got on, but I, am, I never cease to be impressed by the, the number of books uh, in your background. You are a very <laughs> learned man. <laughs> a very learned man. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Well, I've had, a, I've had the luxury to be able to learn. But what's amazing is, you know, when you do a show, I'm sure you know this, you, um, you're consistently humbled by the, the genius of your guests. Mm-hmm. I, you know, you have on people that are just like, wow, they just blow you away with what they know. Yeah, absolutely. I find myself, you, you'll know if I'm, be, if when I'm like staring up like this into the, just processing what's being said. Uh, and I'm excited for you to humble me today. Cause dude, honestly, <laughs> this is, this is one that I'm really, really excited for. Um, you know, you gave me this idea listening to your show, but what I want to talk about is false narratives in the media today. And I want to frame why that is, because on this show, we talk a lot about kind of the crumbling of institutions in general, just because of the nature of the show that tends to focus on central banking. But central banking is just one institution uh, in the US right now. And media is another really, really important one as well. So I actually kind of want to start from a very high level and just ask you, why do you think it feels very divisive in our country today? Right. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is against the background of what I just said. We have institutions crumbling, uh, both on kind of the banking side, the media side of things, healthcare, education, yada, yada. So I guess two part question for you to kick things off. Why do you think we're at their current state of divisiveness that we are? And does it have something to do with the lack of trust in institutions in America? Yeah, I mean, so uh, the simple answer is like, this is one of those questions, like, why are we so divided, which is... Uh, difficult to give a sort of simple answer to and mm. i don't fully know right it's just a question that i grapple with on, on like so many episodes on a regular basis trying to get more clear on it in terms of um is it trust i think trust re reflects i would probably say that our lack of trust reflects um well i think they they're interchangeable like they they both drive each other um but the question is what ha what is why are we or why is a big chunk of the country or possibly even i would say an increasingly large percentage of people growing distrustful and is divisiveness pol and is it just political is it long is it along political lines and if those because one of the things i've also grappled with is that i feel that these categories which are themselves so ill-defined of mm -hmm. left and right or liberal conservative uh, are themselves just inadequate to really describe the the emerging um, I think political consensus that hasn't fully formed, but sort of there. And I think the reason that it hasn't formed yet is partly because we consistently self-sabotage ourselves in finding common ground. Um, and we're actively being sabotaged by these sort of media provocateurs who really are, I think, enemies of the common good. They, this is something you and I talked about. You said it to me in a previous conversation, which is that we tend to ascribe a lot of blame to social media, which is another way of saying to us and to the tech companies which construct the realities or construct the incentives that inform our realities, so we participate in this construction. But actually, we discount the extent to which traditional institutional media outlets and a select number of uh, programs, their hosts, and their producers are actually responsible for this level of division because they're the ones in a position to provide institutional authority and authoritative uh, truth, so to speak. And there's a huge chunk of the country that still trusts these institutions. And also, I should say, it isn't just a problem with the MSNBCs and the CNNs, which do it on this, quote, leftist thing, which we would really have to figure out a new way to define. Mm -hmm. It's also the right-wing media outlets. In fact, Fox News was a pioneer in disinformation and propaganda, and actually MSNBC and CNN adapted to the environment that Fox News created. So um, I think, you know, all yeah. of these, uh, these institutions are, as I said, enemies of the common good. You know, it's funny. There's a lot of talk right now uh, on the education side of things where kids, when COVID hit, 
went back into their parents' homes and, you know, these parents were looking at um, the education that their children were receiving and being like, oh my gosh, I'm not really sure I agree with this or what am I getting for my money? I will say I had a personal experience of I moved back in with my parents for about nine months during COVID and they had CNN on, you know, the entire time that I was there. And I just had this experience of feeling more anxious and eventually I had to tell them, I was like, you guys need to turn this off. Seriously, you need to turn it off because I could just tell it was impacting my mood. So I think there's a more complex in a relationship between social media in general and traditional media outlets. But I got to be honest, <laughs> I mean, if you were to take at its word, either Fox or CNN, you'd have a really warped view of the world, I think, mm -hmm. right now. hundred percent, hundred percent. And you and I were one of the things that prompted this conversation. And by the way, I should say, I compare these outlets to fast food and I tell my parents the same thing. Um, which is that like it's you don't eat fast food you don't eat garbage why are you doing that for your brain what's the reason for it it's mm -hmm. an addiction right it's an addiction to outrage uh, because all of these networks one of the common things that they peddle in and incidentally the same thing is true for social media it's outrage outrage just is a, a very easy feedback mechanism it takes it's a very simple uh input and the output is reliable outrage 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 but the thing that prompted one of the things that prompted this conversation was the Kyle Rittenhouse case. And let's put Fox News aside because I don't know enough about Fox News's coverage of this. Uh, I didn't really watch it after the fact to try and inform myself. But I I actually I actually take your advice, um, the advice that I give to other people as well. Is just, I don't watch the news. Mm -hmm. I have no interest in it whatsoever. And you listeners of Hidden Forces will know that. In point of fact, oftentimes I'm very late to stories, like with COVID. It took me a very long time to dedicate a number of episodes to COVID because, and that reflects the the uh, the significance of the story. Like if it's bigger and more significant, I want to wait. I don't want to be first and be wrong a gazillion ways from Sunday. Mm -hmm. So I stay away and I take my time and I and I and I step into a story. With the Kyle Rittenhouse story, I generally don't even let that kind of stuff get into my um, environment. Like the COVID stuff was absolutely relevant. Mm -hmm. And so I try to inform myself and I just take my time. But with Kyle Rittenhouse, I, there's a sort of subliminal unconscious blockage, block mechanism that happens. So I don't even really bring it in. But there was some some amount that just creeped in mm -hmm. um, over the course of months so that if someone said Kyle Rittenhouse, my reaction would be like, oh, who is that? Wasn't that, isn't that some, isn't that some like white, um, nationalist terrorist who killed some black people at a rally at a blm rally and now he's being charged with murder that would have been my quick answer mm -hmm. um and i don't remember how this story got on my radar maybe someone mentioned i think someone mentioned it someone said to me hey man this stuff is crazy I'm like, what are you talking about? So I, I decided to, you know what? I was like, I had some time. I decided to look into it. So the first thing I did was I just went online and I started looking at all the just hours and hours of testimony, primarily the defense um, interview of Kyle Rittenhouse on the stand, the cross-examination, which blew me away by the prosecution of Rittenhouse. And then some other vid videos too, like of uh, Gage, I can't pronounce his last name, the guy with the block that pointed it at Rittenhouse that got shot in the in the bicep who survived, as well as some other footage by NBC that was just kind of uh, documentary style footage of what happened with video and everything else. I was blown away. Mm -hmm. I was blown away. And then I went and looked at what the mainstream media was saying. I listened to um, Megyn Kelly's podcast, uh, Barry Weiss's podcast, and they both had a montage, which I then found online, yeah. of guys like Joe Scarborough, um, Joy Reid, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell, um, like a lot of people, some one, you know, some people who I actually kind of generally like, like uh, I can't remember his name. I'd written it down. Um, I was just blown away because I and then I, I wrote a thread about this. And this is probably what you read, which was that honestly. It's hard not to ascribe malice to the narratives that were put out by these people and these institutions because they put them out before they could ever possibly know what happened. The, the the facts that they presented were so egregiously wrong. And just like the weapons of mass destruction with Saddam Hussein, there were certain outlets that didn't explicitly say that there was evidence that, let's say, Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons, like the Bush administration. They didn't expressly say that he had nukes, but they did say that something could be a mushroom cloud, like the Condoleezza Rice. They wanted the country to think 
that the, that that Saddam Hussein pre- presented a nuclear threat to the country. Similarly, these outlets, by omission, because they they explicitly stated the race of Kyle Rittenhouse, which was white, and then they explicitly omitted the fact that the people he killed was were white. So the natural assumption was, given the framing that we consistently are presented with, was that Kyle Rittenhouse shot and killed African Americans in in the United States in Kenosha. And so that was that I believe was a a, a a purposeful omission. It was meant to create the sense of, to fit in a particular story, to stimulate outrage, to generate views, to generate clicks, to get viewers, and to sell ad dollars. Mm. And um, and also I think to elevate certain people whose brands are aligned with this narrative. Mm. And it is, it is, it's hard to describe. It's immoral. It is. As I said, it's it's the behavior of people that are enemies of the common good. They're not interested in actually bringing the country together. They're actively dividing us, and they're the truth is that this it's it's wholly racist. Mm. The whole framing of all this stuff it is consistently feeding into race divisions mm. constantly, so that people in America who don't have that natural who aren't naturally acclimated to think that way or certainly not to that extent, are constantly now thinking in these categorical identitarian terms. Mm. And so, of course, that is divisive. Yeah. So I want to get, and there's a lot to unpack there. There's a lot of power structures, uh, I think, that aren't super obvious when you look at something like this. And in case regular listeners of the show are like, why are we talking about Kyle Rittenhouse right now? Let me tell you why. Because I think this is I'm – I'm not going to sit here and have a strong opinion on Kyle Rittenhouse one way or the other. What I do think is really – important to point out about this is that there are two completely different sets of facts out there in the world. And, you know, I can tell you, you know, as much as, you know, one group of people believes one thing about Kyle Rittenhouse, the other group believes something completely different. And Mm -hmm. I'm starting to view this lack of objective truth as a bigger and bigger problem in American society today. And I guess my question to you is why do you what, – what do we really think is the root cause here? Is this just a broken model when it comes to media, right, and how people want to consume information? Does it go deeper than that, right? Like I kind of have ideas about where the real fault lines lie for something like this. But when you start to unpack a question like why is it starting to feel like there's just less objective truth in America today? A, do you agree with that? Hmm. B, how much is the media – how much is other stuff that are going on in people's lives? Well, I, you know, you're talking to someone who would who would argue that um, objective truth is not ontologically defensible. <laughs> it isn't something that you can you can sort of provide an airtight um, empirical justification for, and mm-hmm. we don't have to get into that. But I think that to the extent that objective truth exists, it is ultimately formed by certain base assumptions that we come to as a society, yep. and it also, I think, ultimately. And I don't know enough about this to speculate on it, and you should probably bring on some anthropologists and sociologists <laughs> who might be able to give you some answers on what the science says. But I imagine that because human beings are hierarchical creatures, authority plays a huge role in providing some sort of um, strong uh, consensus view of what truth is. And I think that maybe this actually answers your original question. I actually think that the break, the disillusionment with institutions and with uh, sort of traditional sources of authority has, has, has definitely eroded trust in society. And that erosion of trust has made it difficult to come to agreement on things because it turns out that having a, um, having a, a sort of protocol for arriving at truth, which I'm a huge fan of, um, which is, you know, the scientific method, empiricism, is not actually sufficient, really, on a society-wide scale, because most people don't operate that way, and also because, again, the empirical method is based on certain base assumptions, your capacity, your willingness to accept the measurements that you you come to, recognizing that you yourself are the instrument that's being used to measure <laughs> the results. That's, yeah. You know, so like when when people lose trust on such a fundamental level, they become paranoid. Because ultimately, you do discover that there is – you can question everything and kind of legitimately. So in such a world where there is no bottom, there is no top, you're sort of just floating, what is it that congeals uh, society? And I think it is – it's conventions, it's institutions, it's sources of authority, and it is this sort of uh, 
interplay. There's no discrete way to measure and come to objective truth. And we are so fractured. And you have these nodes, you know, to use a, a computer science term or a network term, you have these nodes in the network, which mm. are these platformed people who have presented a narrative that is that is deeply at odds with the fundamental nature of power in a pluralistic society like the United States, that it 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 doesn't allow it it has so far, uh, you know, like muddled up our ability to actually make progress in addressing the real roots of the problem, to addressing power. It's a cloak for power. This narrative is a cloak for power. I I think that's at the crux of the issue, right? What are the real power structures that are going on in the United States? And the reason I felt so strongly about doing this episode is because I increasingly think that the real power structures that are driving issues that the United States is facing is not what is being publicly discussed in any way, shape, or form whatsoever, right? And, you know, just to give you like a minor example of that, right? There's so much airtime that's being played, right, or being given right now to Kyle Rittenhouse in general that it distracts from things that we should be paying attention to. Literally, you could just, the, the trial of Ahmaud Arbery is going on right now. Why is that getting one tenth or one twentieth the coverage of Kyle Rittenhouse? The trial of Ghislaine Maxwell is going on. Don't even get and me. If you started. want to put your little tinfoil cap on, I mean, that you is. You don't even need a tinfoil cap for that one. That's crazy. That's nuts. Uh, and I think you don't even need a tinfoil hat for that one. I mean, it's got all the major players, the brother of the of the king of England or, or the prince or whoever Andrew is, like whatever he's considered. Bill Clinton, the former president, two term president of the United States and tons of other people. Way bigger interest story. Way more interesting. No coverage. I mean, God knows what really happened there. Yeah. We'll never know. We'll never know. Who knows, man? And we're, I, we're, ple we're plebs, man. We're not meant to know those things. So media is – it's one of the foundations, the core foundations of the United States and I believe a free society in general. When media is functioning well, it holds truth to power and holds those in power to account. But recently it's seeming as though – like forgetting even Kyle Rittenhouse for a second, like even a lot of the narratives around inflation in general and it being actually a good thing – I mean, I'm kind who's of saying, this. Who's saying that now? Who's saying that now? Big mainstream outlets. I wish I had examples for you now, but it's like, uh, here's like, why inflation no. isn't so bad. Uh, and it's oh. like, uh, you know, wages, if wages rise higher than prices, then inflation is actually good. And it's The thing with inflation is wild because it's like one of these things where we still don't know what causes it. I know. You know, and the yeah. Fed has been trying to generate it for 10 years, supposedly. What's interesting, it's so fascinating what they've generated in a way is double-digit asset price inflation consistently yeah. time over time, yeah, right? right. Um, and, and in crypto, they generated hyperinflation. Yeah, for right? sure. They, in these new asset classes that have been created. And what they've done is dramatically exacerbated the wealth gap. And now prices are going up for everybody else, right? Um, and in some ways, it's also a bit ironic when folks like Larry Summers come out uh, strongly um, against – the current expansive policy when they see a pickup in consumer prices. Where the hell have these guys been all this time with asset prices going through the moon and pricing out the vast majority of Americans from being able to have control over their future? This is yeah. like the deep anxiety in crypto around we're not going to make it. Are we going to make it? Are we not going to make it? It's, it's this idea of like, can I accumulate enough assets to be okay? Which itself is, I think, also holds us back as a society. This idea that we need to you know, we need to be able to accumulate some amount of assets because I just don't think it's true. I don't think that that assets provide that kind of um, that kind of safety. But the whole thing with inflation is just it's no one knows what causes it. We're trying to figure out, first of all, is the current inflation demand driven? Is it supply driven? If it's supply driven, what do what are what is tightening monetary policy going to do to solve the problem exactly if it's demand driven well then is it endogenously demand driven or is it demand driven because of all the fiscal stimulus no one knows these guys can't figure it out it's all bullshit no one trusts them deep down and the, 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 the this is what this is all going towards it's a loss a steady loss of credibility and when you got guys like lauren yeah. summers muhammad el larian um bill dudley Etc. coming out, these institutionalists and criticizing the Fed and saying they're behind the curve, 
slowly but surely and maybe rapidly eventually, like Mark Twain says, <laughs> the Fed's ba- credibility is going to go totally bankrupt. Mm-hmm. And this is a really, I got to say, it's for sure, I don't want to minimize the precariousness of the moment, but it, I can't I can't pretend not to also be excited as someone in media and someone who has been following this for so long to see what's going to happen. Because we've been in a regime for the last um, – well, I'm going to focus specifically on since the financial crisis, which has dramatically dampened volatility, managed mm-hmm. the economy. The Fed is in there propping everything up. Everything is going up in unison, bonds, stocks, everything. And all the sort of portfolio allocation strategies and diversity, everything's sort of on automation, automated – Diverse, the, the notions of diversification are based on the current performance of or the recent performance and behavior of assets relative to each other and the covariances. That breaks down mm-hmm. if we move into a new system where the Fed is no longer credible. It's constantly playing catch up and it is now taking the lead from markets and markets are no longer engaged in this fiction that the Fed knows best. We're in for a turbulent time and no one knows what assets are are going to be the safe ones to invest in in that period? Um, and you know, it's just it's a wild time, man. It's a wild time to be in this business. We're in the best business, Michael. I I, I completely agree, man. I completely agree. Um, I do have a question for you. One more thing before I'm going to move on, move back to the media side of things. You know, one thing that I've struggled with a lot, and I just don't have a great answer for this, but you hinted at it at that great interview that you did um, about Nikeification. This idea, you really made me think about this, but. Help me solve this problem, which is, you know, when you look at the labor force right now, we have labor outages all over the place, right? So there's one group of people that says people are just lazy. They just don't want to work, yada, yada. And then, but it does seem like the jobs in at least the U.S. have totally bifurcated into these great jobs, right? You're either working at Google, making $300,000 a year, you know, working literally nine to four, right, with one day off. It's nuts what they give you. Or you're in a service industry where your wage hasn't changed in however long and you're just – you just have these really crappy options basically. And mm-hmm. I'm not sure – you know, Trump's whole platform was we're going to bring the jobs back over from China. And I kind of heard that and I was like, I kind of feel like you've actually identified the root cause problem. Like globalization, you could make a really strong argument. I mean it certainly eliminated the – it was not good for the middle class of the US. But I also look at it and I'm like, would that solve anything? I don't even think Americans want – those crappy jobs that we exported anymore. How, how do you mm. think through solving that? I just don't have any good answer for that I'm problem. Right, I'm right with you, man. I don't have any good answers. <laughs> um, the problem with jobs and the availability of good jobs and their distribution also reflects certain um, – it reflects the progress that we've made technologically in the society, which is only going to advance, and it seems at an increasingly rapid pace. And that's – you know that's that ref, that speaks to an episode I did with Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, mm. which um, dealt exactly with this issue around artificial intelligence. And when you look at the types of progress, the type of progress that's being made in AI, and the incentives driving the, the advancement, you do become very concerned. There's good reason to be concerned about the societal and political implications. And so I, I don't know, man. That's not an easy one to solve. And I don't I do not I'm not a believer in the solution of giving people money because then we move into the Huxleyan view of the world, Agreed. which is that you basically have this um, paternal state, hopefully uh, beneficent, that just placates people, gives them dopamine, you know, positive dopamine reactions, and people just become what Ted Kaczynski said, domesticated animals. Um and that's a very scary future. You know, it doesn't leave doesn't leave a lot of hope for those of us who aren't in the sort of upper echelons of the power structure. Yeah, I agree. One more question on this idea of power structures before we return to media and some of the problems there. You know, one really core belief that I have is that we have more in common with each other than we do indifference, right? I, I really mm-hmm. genuinely believe that as humans, we have a lot of overlapping needs and desires and wants, and we are not as different from each other as y- you would think just looking out into society today. And mm-hmm. one of the reasons you know, I felt so strongly about doing this episode is because if you were to just look at different media like CNN versus Fox, you would look and be like, it's the right versus the left. But that division doesn't feel 
really correct to me. It just something in my gut says I don't think that's really where the difference lies. I don't think that's how the country's divided up right now. There are a couple different ways to divide that up, right? Like I, I tend to draw a lot on the show back to wealth inequality. I think that is a core driver um, of a lot of what we're seeing right now. And I want to get back into that when it comes to media because I actually think that impacts media coverage. Uh, but you know, you could divide up, you could divide things up being like, well, there's you know the boomer generation that has all the wealth, and then there's millennial Gen Z. Maybe that's a division. Maybe it's the elites, right, versus the uh, you know the proletariats versus the bourgeoisie, right, type thing, where it's like these elites have all the money, and and it's really these blue collar workers, and that's what a division is. Is it a combination of all three? Like, how do you start to parse out where the I keep using this phrase, but I kind of like it, like the fault lines. Where do the fault lines really lie? Yeah, isn't there like a, show, a podcast called Fault Lines? I don't um, know. Anyway, I uh, subconsciously steal from things all the time. So uh, yeah, <laughs> probably. we all do. We all we all do. That's that's uh, intellectual appropriation still allowed. Thank God. <laughs> thank um, God. Another crazy thing, right? The culture appropriation that that's bad. I I grew up thinking that was great. That mm-hmm. means that you actually enjoy other cultures. It's not like I'm what's his name, uh, uh, Paul Simon, uh, reappropriating South African music and then commercializing it and making hundreds of millions of dollars. You know. Um, so I heard something interesting when, in your responses, which was verses, a lot of verses. Mm-hmm. And I do, I, I actually wonder about this. If, um, one is, do we always need to have, can, can anything exist? And this, this is like, a, you know, this is also a philosophical question that people have been grappling with forever, which is, can anything exist without its opposite? <laughs> you know, can, can, can we have, can we, can we formulate an understanding of the world without contrasting it to contrasting things in it to something else right um you know i think it was like einstein that said that that there could never be a universe with nothing in it that there's there would sort of be a paradox so i i i i'm struck by the fact that in today's world i think what's unique about it is that all the enemies all the contrasts are within you know we haven't found something to unify against they try to create these artificial things like unifying against climate change or unifying against cancer or the virus um but these things do seem to fall short um and so i i think one that's just an observation i wanted to make in terms of um what is the right framing is it left versus right is it boomers versus millennials what is it again i i don't think it's one thing and i don't think it has to be one thing but I do think all of these things that we've been talking about reflect that the, the fact that there is a breakdown in a common identity. And we are living in a time now where the trend is to seek constantly new identities to uh, point towards and sort of try and – it's almost like crypto. It's like you launch your, your – you know, every single person wants their cryptocurrency to do better, and there are an infinite number of cryptocurrencies. Uh, so – there's like an infinite number of identities and people are constantly trying to elevate their particular one. And there are these conflicts that consistently happen and we fail to recognize that there are things that, that bring us together and that together we're stronger. This is sort of like, you know, what is the, that, tr- that sort of that thing that two pencils are stronger than one pencil. Apes together, apes strong. Apes strong, <laughs> apes strong, exactly. Uh, so we fail to recognize that these are like time, you know, uh, timeless lessons. And and while they're cliches, they're true. And I think that this is this is the problem. But then the question is, can you artificially create unity? Mm. And that's not clear either. So I don't know what the way out of this is. But I do think that if I do believe that if all of these selfish um, enemies of the common good, enemies of the nation, enemies of humanity who make millions of dollars, have huge platforms, go to great cocktail dinners, you know, bump elbows with power, and who sit on these platforms and abuse them by stoking fear, division, hatred in the country. I think if these people had moral principles, uh, because this is one case where you truly can isolate the factors. These people uh, don't have to do this. You know, they can make constant choice. They have choices. They choose to uh, to tear people apart. I think if if people in this position changed their attitude and they had a different culture about them, I think we'd see dramatic improvement. Same thing with the with the tech companies. By the way, Tristan Harris. Um, you and I have talked about Tristan. Uh, he was recently on Joe Rogan, but he's done other people's podcasts as well. 
he talks about this consistently, and he's doing one of the best jobs out there educating people on the role that social media platforms play in constructing incentives that drive these types of awful outcomes. So these two, the, the tech companies and these people, these nodes in the media network, if these people changed, we'd see a huge improvement. Howdy, everyone. This episode is brought to you by Coinbase Prime, the leading prime brokerage solution for all things digital assets, providing secure custody, trading, and financing to an institutional suite of clients. On the retail side of things, I am more than happy to make this endorsement because I have been a custody, customer of Coinbase since the day that I got into crypto. I still keep the vast majority of my assets there, actually, and I do it for one reason and one reason alone, so that I can sleep easy at night knowing that my funds are safe. It's the same reason when family or friends ask me, where should I buy my first Bitcoin? I direct them to Coinbase. And now, finally, when institutions are starting to ask, what's the most safe infrastructure to use? I only point them in one direction, to Coinbase Prime. And the reason that I do that is because it is peace of mind. When it comes to security, Everything is top of the line on this platform, and it's a white glove experience to boot. They've been securing client assets at scale for eight years, which as of Q2 of this year is $180 billion. They have an industry-leading insurance policy, and they're audited by Blue Chip auditors so that you can sleep easy at night too. So stop listening to me, click the link at the bottom of this episode, and go check them out for yourself. And when you get there, tell them that I sent you because I love to get credit. When it comes to crypto, security and custody is paramount. Introducing this episode's sponsor, Ledger, your secure gateway to buy, exchange, and grow your crypto assets. I know I've got a smart audience, so I'm assuming slash hoping that most of you already have your Ledger hardware wallet, but just in case you don't, this is how I think about it. I wouldn't get into a car if I couldn't wear a seatbelt, and I don't operate in crypto unless I can do it from my Ledger hardware wallet. Crypto is really exciting, but it is still the Wild West. There are lots of risks, and Ledger is the easiest way to make sure that you are still protected. And the best part about Ledger is that you don't need to make any trade-offs between security of your funds and utility of your assets because Ledger has Ledger Live, which is a software that syncs right up to your Ledger hardware wallet, and you can do anything that you'd want to do with your crypto assets. You can easily send and receive, you can buy and exchange, and you can get access to staking. And they've actually started to aggregate some of the best DeFi apps and services out there. Two of my favorites, Paraswap, a decentralized aggregator, and they've got Lido for staking. And stay tuned, I'm going to keep you guys updated. They've got some really cool services uh, coming out soon. Aave, Compound, and One Inch among them. So if you take one thing away from this, guys, please, please, please make sure that you're protected in this space. Get yourself a Ledger hardware wallet today and start using the Ledger Live app. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Thank me later. What I, so I listened to that podcast and it was real, there were a lot of takeaways that I had uh, that you sent me, the Joe Rogan podcast. One, one thing I've observed in general, so you look at, to go back to Kyle Rittenhouse, I, I think that was probably a failure of traditional media. But when you look at, where, like, where do you point the causal arrow for why? I think, I think in general, social media, he's become the tail that is wagging the dog of traditional media. And you can look at that from a number of reasons. One, just audiences go on social media. Look at the ad dollars that get spent on social media versus traditional media. It is the superior business model and it's the it's the distribution mechanism. And each one thing that I've learned in content creation, you probably learned this too, is that content has to conform to the medium in general. Right? Like the 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 medium of podcasting requires these deep long form conversations like you and I are talking about. On Twitter it's these like witty, pithy little things that don't even mean anything. Uh so they're different, you know, the content has to conform to the medium. And the medium now is social, and that is dictating the content. So what I would argue is the medium constraints of social media are going reverberating back to traditional media, and they're conforming to what will perform on social. And maybe that's mm. obvious to a lot of people, but great point. I, I really think that's what's going on now. Um, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, that, so, that the – the the incentives constructed through the algorithms and social media are increasingly they're eating the world yeah they've they now infiltrated uh, uh the 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 legacy uh institutions which now turn their giant megaphones and use the logic of these of these platforms to inform the output of the microphone of the megaphone to the inform the 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 content they put out i completely agree and so again, I, I agree with Tristan Harris, man. And I've been on this bandwagon for years, I think since the very beginning of the podcast. 
which is that if we don't reform, this is this has to be one of like the, the number one priorities because if we don't reform what's going on on social media, uh, we can't get anywhere else because this is like this. These are the public squares. Our pre the former president of the United <laughs> States was a fucking troll on Twitter. I know. Literally, he used Twitter to uh, he was excellent at it. And he spoke in these little, you know, whatever the character count is now. I like, keep forgetting if it's 270 or 160. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you can't deny the power of these platforms. And they deplatformed him. Also insane. I know. Completely, ins just completely outrageous. Private companies deplatforming the president of the United States. So many things have happened in the last, like, eight years or four years and then eight years and ten years, whatever. Like, the, the, I really... I mean, I start the clock with the 9-11 attacks. Um, so there are different points that we can sort of focus on. 2008 was a big one. But the, the Trump administration, so many other things change as well. Our respect for the office, the cloak around it, um, many of the, the norms around debates. I mean, when Trump was on the Republican primary stage, he tore into the Bush legacy. He tore into the Republican Party. And so, like, a lot of the myths and illusions that have kept us, you know, semi-organized in, in the United States are quickly being, in some cases, just uh, eviscerated, you know? So that goes back to the point about trust and, like, what is causing people to be increasingly divided? I agree. I think, you know, to tie this back to the thing that I love to tie this back to, which is wealth inequality, that Maslow's hierarchy – I think a lot of people don't realize this. Media is a mirror. Media is a mirror of society. And the degree to which people are unhappy will impact how warped that mirror becomes. So, you know, one thing that I really do strongly object to is this idea that people are shaping the narrative. I don't know if you feel like this about being a content creator. I don't feel like I really have the ability to just get up here and say whatever I want. Like if I did an episode in, on this show of, uh, you know, cupcakes or something or these delicious cupcakes, people would be like, people would tell me, what the hell, what the hell did you do that for? This is what I come to you for. So I really do feel like as the co-founder of a media company, as the host of a podcast, like I'm beholden to the people that are listening to my show and I have an obligation to provide content that will be helpful to them. Now, I think where there's opportunity for, let's say, tampering with that is kind of on the margin, right? Or on the fringes of that or how things are framed. No pun intended. No, no pun intended. Yeah. You know that like Leonardo DiCaprio meme where he's like, like that? Yeah, you know, exactly. Said it in the, but I, I really do believe that. And, uh, you know, so one thing I really strenuously object to is this, uh, they're controlling everything and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a narrative change. Like, no, I, I, as, as an operator of a media company, I really believe – that they are giving the information that they believe their audience wants. The problem is, the problem is that that's the information that the audience wants. I, I really believe that. Yeah, very, and, very good observation. Yeah. This is also the system's own doing because a lot of these outfits have decided to grow by targeting specific audiences mm -hmm. and by adopting particular views and not taking an open-minded approach and consistently weeding the garden. You know, like if you don't have people pissed off at you on a regular basis within your audience, leaving, writing negative reviews, you're not doing something right. You made this really good point about previous narratives that have united nations. In so like no Christianity, no metaphysics right. anymore framework. So I think what we've replaced that with is narratives in general. And there are big ones that are initiated by – so war on terror, big narrative. War on Huge. drugs, big narrative. And, yeah. you know, it's really funny. You're totally right. Those are unwinnable wars. Mm -hmm. And we've lost every single one f for what it's worth. You know, they just kind of go on for 40 years. It informs a lot of policy decisions. They tend to come up around crises. The war on terror came at 9-11, right? The, I don't really know the history of this. So, But, you know, I, I think, right, the war on drugs, was that around the I think the, the war on drugs, anyway? either the war on drugs started under the Nixon administration because the Nixon administration also did the war on cancer. Um, or it started under the Reagan administration, right? But we tell, but we tell ourselves that we won all of these. By the way, we we t we <laughs> tell ourselves that we won all of them, right? Like that's the thing. There's no honesty. There's no self reflection. Wasn't this in? The, I thought this was in the Reagan era where you know the war the, on drugs, drugs, but not the 
drugs that are legal, the illegal drugs. The illegal not drugs. Not the ones that you can OD on that you get a prescription for, the ones that you may not be able to OD on but that you bought illicitly because we decided that they're illicit. Right. And it wasn't like the drugs that white people use. It was the drugs that black people use, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. That's Crack a great game. That's a man. That's a great example of okay. There's this overarching narrative. There's a seed of truth in it. Nobody's going to deny and say that drugs are bad. But really, there was a totally different and really pretty nefarious reason for why that narrative existed. So to go back to just I think as a useful check for yourself, if you find yourself fully agreeing with everything that the Republicans say or everything that the Democrats say, I would just check yourself, man. Just check yourself because I think there's a very, very low chance historically that dominant narratives at the time that are being pushed by a party or a group of people that you don't fully understand the incentives of, I find it very, very hard to believe that they're all just dead on right, you know? And Mm. I think you should find yourself questioning and going across the line every once in a while. I think that's a good measure of that you have your brain turned on and you're thinking. So, yeah, it was (laughs) – that's one thing I've said to to you and, and Nathaniel Whitmore over mm. at uh, CoinDesk as well, which is that uh, your your people I listen to in crypto because you haven't switched off your brain. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, hey man, I think this what you're really talking about here is something that uh, is out of practice, which is ethics and journalism. Mm. You know, that used to be a thing. Like people had ethics. They had they they systematically return to a certain ethical bible they ask themselves questions do i have the right to publish this do i have the right number of sources do what do i know this like i have a framework for truth it's imperfect it's it's ontologically in, non-defensible but it is a framework that i've decided to use the same thing with when, when you're investing like you have to have an idea of what risks you're willing to take and you can't just decide to change that because you're feeling euphoric today so the, just because you wake up in the morning, you have a bad – Joe Scarborough, you wake up, you didn't get enough sleep, you rolled into the studio at MSNBC at 5.30 in the morning, and you're angry, and you decide to just say some pure bullshit on air about, a, about someone else's murder case that you know nothing about because you just feel entitled to do it, that's unethical. That's completely unethical. Mm. And like people like you need to be called out on it, and quite frankly, you shouldn't have a job at MSNBC mm. because you're not a journalist. And so – I don't even think MSNBC should rebrand itself as a propaganda outfit and that that should be allowed. I just don't think they should be in business. Just mm-hmm. like I don't think Fox should be in business, spewing all that propaganda. You know, I'll, I, it's not a left or right thing. I'm not, I'm not biased on no. this, man. <clears throat> I think these media outlets are propaganda machines. They, have, they, ha- they also operate in an environment where they are incentivized to do this. And like, to go back to my point, I understand – People at low levels in these companies, there are lots of good people that are forced into the machine. But Joe Scarborough is, Scarborough is not forced into the machine. He doesn't have to go out there on television and imperil the life of a child, a 17-year-old boy who he knows nothing about, who, who, whose parents are divorced, who God knows the difficulties that he's faced. And what did we learn after the fact that he was a volunteer? He was volunteer in the fire department. He had, he had an interest in policing, had an interest in being a medic. He had an interest in serving his community. I mean, I don't pro, 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 uh, I don't su- to suggest that I know all the facts of. I certainly don't know the internal, you know, mindset of that child. But couldn't you just imagine the possibility that he is a child looking for inspiration? He's looking for a role model. He's looking to be to be valued in his community. And so he makes a stupid decision to literally go and defend a car lot. He wasn't looking to shoot anybody, and all the videos show that. He did make a stupid decision. He should have been out there. Maybe he should have had better parents. But who are you to go on your platform on national television and imperil this kid's life, destroy his life? That's unethical in the extreme, and you should be ashamed of yourself. And there's two, th- two things that went really wrong, I think, with that trial. One, just a startling lack of empathy. Two, you know, in psychology, they teach you. So the, the, I, I, the, they took a whole class on this, which is the framing of different stories, right? Framing is actually, as it turns out, really, really important in general. I think looking at this uh, episode with Kyle, the most obvious framing for me is what I didn't agree with. I don't think a 17-year-old should be allowed – to drive anywhere they want with an AR-15. I just think that's I'm I will. Well, he I'm, didn't even own the gun. I mean, he he had no right to purchase the gun. He's lucky that he got off on a technicality on on being able to possess it because of the length of the rifle. Right. You know. 
point being, though, I, I think there was a clear Incredibly discussion to be had. Decision. Yeah, it's a very stupid decision, and I think there's a real conversation to be had. But to me, the conversation is the amount of guns in the country, man. Another point of hypocrisy, because I remember this one time. Matt Damon was out, like, lecturing people about gun usage and the violence. And I literally remember that day I was staring at a poster. It was, like, 2015 or something of, like, his latest Jason Bourne movie. And he's, like, got a gun, and he's, like pointing it at the freaking, po you know, through the poster right at you. And it's like, don't you guys, you guys, you, you tell these boys that manhood is strength and strength is weaponry. It's guns, it's rifles, it's first person shooters. Like this is the culture we live in. You tell this kid, this is what it means to be a man. The jobs are disappearing. The opportunities to, to, to come of age and to engage in the power process are limited. And so you're upset because the kid takes an AR-15 and goes to the to the car dealership to defend it, not to shoot anybody. Again, if you actually engage with the facts of this case, that kid genuinely brought the rifle. This is the most sort of logical explanation based on all the evidence and all the opportunities of the prosecution to cross-examine him and to also make their case. He brought the rifle there to defend himself, possibly also to simply be a show of force, to dissuade people from attacking him, and to do a bunch of other things. Stupid decision. Stupid decision to even go there. But, like, this is, you. I mean, the, the, the inability to grapple with the nuance and the reality and to want to prosecute this kid and make an example out of him, this is, this is the world we live in, right? We're just looking for scapegoats. We're not actually addressing the problems because, again, these narratives are a cloak for power so that we don't address the fundamental inequities in society, the maldistribution, the poor structure that's leading increasingly to bad outcomes that are not going to be good for anybody. Because even if you have a home in New Zealand, eventually they're going to come for you. Even if you have private jets and you can fly on the world, that's not an ideal world to live in where it's scorched earth. People can't get along. Well, we have nuclear weapons on this planet. Like, mm. how do those systems operate? You know what I mean? All of that is based on communal trust and the trust of institutions, and all of that is breaking down. And so many people in positions of power today are stoking that. So on this on the show, I've oscillated between seemingly feeling very um, despondent about the future, like, oh my gosh, we have all these problems. How is society ever going to grapple with all the huge problems that are ahead of it? While simultaneously feeling very optimistic and excited. And I think the best way I have of uniting those two different views that I oscillate between is this idea that institutions are breaking down right now, but I think we have a good opportunity to build new ones. And if you look throughout history, this is a pretty repeated cycle. Institutions don't tend to last much more than 100 years. And in general, I, I do think this could be an opportunity for a younger generation or a different uh, demographic of people or whatever to build institutions that work for them. I suppose. Do you also view that? I, I know you said before in the show that you were feeling optimistic and excited about things. Do you find yourself feeling more optimistic about the future? Or are you worried about things? How do you shake out? The, the optimistic answer is that engaging in the work that I do, trying to hold myself accountable, uh, engaging with people like you, engaging with people like Julius Krein, you can't help but feel optimistic because you realize that it's, there are people out there, you're not alone, in wanting to grapple with these issues seriously. Where it, it, it uh, where you feel pessimistic is maybe when you engage with the the dominant media structures, which mm. feels so pessimistic. Mm. The story is on both on both on all the political spectrums, the country is burning. These are the people that are doing it. They'll give you different enemies, and you're just kind of throwing your hands up in the air. And you don't know what to do. It's like doom porn. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think so. I, I guess you know, be the ch what's, what's that uh, is the Krishnamurti. Be the change or the you Gandhi, want to see in the, the world. Gandhi, the Gandhi quote, right? Uh, be the change you want to see in the world. We all have to, and I, I, I genuinely uh, mean this because I live my life this way. You have to, you have to live your life the way you want, the way you think other people should live their lives in order for the society and for the world to be a, a good place. You know, like you ever watch Ted Lasso? Yeah, my, you got man. My wife got me on onto it, and it's like one of the only shows that I'm willing to watch <laughs> consistently. Um, man, like I love Ted Lasso. I love that guy. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I just love his attitude. I love his optimism. I love his good heart. Again, this, I don't know, this is kind of now I'm mix, mixing and matching things, but as I've gotten older, you know, when I was younger, kindness wasn't on my top list of attributes that I sought in other people. But now it's at, it's at the very top, you know, mm, kindness. Yeah. And, uh, 
we don't have enough kindness out there. And that's not, that's not like some, you know, throwaway line. Like kindness is compassion, uh, giving people the benefit of the doubt. That's how you move, you move forward. If you don't have that in your relationships, you're not going to have a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. So like the way that you, you, you keep marriages together, the way that you keep relationships together, the way you keep countries together is you find common ground. You're constantly looking for common ground and we're just not there right now. You know? Yeah. You know, who's the best, uh, the most real life Ted Lasso that you'll ever meet? Do Jason, I know him? Jason Yanowitz. <laughs> I got, <laughs> I got to shout him out, man. He's Honestly, it's one of the best things. You know, I've been working very closely with Jason for the last four years. It is his absolute best quality that he cares about people and genuinely is a really optimistic guy. And, uh, you know, I, I try to learn. I, I'm not sure I'm that's as so slanted. That's because I, I would say that's how you are. Oh, I mean, I, I know you that. and Jason both. I feel like that's how you are. In fact, I'd, I, I'd say you're at the very top of that. I, I mean, you're a really nice guy, man. Oh, you're thanks. very open-minded. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're not – you don't like uh, – you're not overly judgy. Uh, you have, I think you also have a lot of friends who cross political lines and, uh, you know, different points of view. Hmm. So which is good for you because you open your horizons and it makes you a more informed person. Yeah. All right, man. That's all. I, we could have gone for another <laughs> two hours, I'm sure. But that's <laughs> uh, that's all the time we got. So. All right. This well, thanks great, for having man. me on, Michael. Thanks for doing this. Appreciate you it. You got it. You got it.